higher education has created this monster of snowflakes, yeah. of post-modernity, where we actually think we can silence the opposition and we can do it under the banner of tolerance. We actually have the audacity to say, I can't tolerate your intolerance. I hate you hateful people. I'm sure that nothing is sure. I know that nothing can be known. I'm absolutely confident there are no absolutes. And we say this with a straight face. It's pablum. It's political pablum. It's not teaching the time-tested truths of God. College campuses used to be strongholds of free speech and exchanging ideas, but today all that's changed. Students now demand universities provide safe spaces to protect them from ideas that may cause them emotional harm. They want to be shielded from ideas or opinions they find offensive, going so far as to request trigger warnings to help them avoid hearing, seeing, or reading anything that might upset them. This thinking has led to some college guest speakers being protested, harassed, and even barred from campuses because they support views some students don't like. It's also caught the attention of Congress. Conservative commentator Ben Shapiro and comedian Adam Carolla recently testified about what some call the Snowflake Rebellion. All of our views should be judged on their merits, not on the color or sex or sexual orientation of the speaker, and those views should never be banned on the grounds that they offend someone. Even Christian colleges are not immune. We've lost the desire to teach what's true. We now, de we now give degrees and opinions rather than actually learning something, and this is absurd. Richard Weaver told us in 1948 in his seminal work titled Ideas Have Consequences, yeah. that ideas have consequences, yeah. they matter. And when you teach good ideas, you get good culture, good kids, good community, good government, good church. And when you teach bad ideas, you get the opposite. And what we have today is ideological fascism on our campuses rather than academic freedom. We actually are telling people, mm -hmm. conservative speakers primarily, if you don't agree with us, if you're not one of us, if you're not a, a part of the fascist, the common bond of ideas, we will crush you, we will expel you, you're verboten, you're unwelcome. This is not classical liberal arts education because it's not liberty, it's not freedom, it's not justice, it's fascism, it's not freedom. Uh, we see these angry red faces of these 19 and 21 year olds in the campus green protesting and saying, we don't agree with you, you've offended us, there's an idea here we don't like and therefore we want to silence you, you're unwelcome. What kind of academic freedom is that? Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus told us that yeah. you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Opinions always lead to bondage and slavery That's and right. truth sets us free. Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. The Bible is the Word of God. Truth is given by God and wisdom Holiness, sanctification, obedience is demanded by God. It's not optional. So by and large, people are recognizing we've created a monster. It's turning around to bite us. We've lost the ability to understand that truth is the context for freedom. And when you stop mm -hmm. teaching truth, human freedom is lost. The National Rifle Association taking criticism on the heels of their latest ad. This one targeting the New York Times. Watch this. We the people have had it. We've had it with your narratives, your propaganda, your fake news. We've had it with your constant protection of your Democrat overlords, your refusal to acknowledge any truth that upsets the fragile construct that you believe is real life. And we've had it with your pretentious tone deaf assertion that you are in any way truth or fact based journalism. Consider this the shot across your proverbial bow. We're going to fisk the New York Times and find out just what deep rich means to this old gray hag, this untrustworthy, dishonest rag that has subsisted on the welfare of mediocrity for one, two, three more decades. We're going to laser focus on your so-called honest pursuit of truth. In short, we're coming for you. An Atlanta gym is stirring controversy this week, posting a profanity-laced sign, there's a picture of it, banning cops and military members from using 
its gym facility. The owner saying, quote, American police are really just an entity. They serve capitalism and they serve white supremacy. And that's the way we see that. We felt that it was important to create zones where cops are explicitly not welcome. The Knoxville, Tennessee Police Department will be removing a Christian plaque today. It's been hanging in the police department for 50 years. The plaque is of Romans 8:31, which says, quote, What shall we say in response to these things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? The police department is being threatened with a lawsuit unless it takes the plaque down. The Freedom From Religion Foundation is demanding the plaque be taken down, saying it violates the separation of church and state. A police department spokesman says the department simply doesn't have enough money, taxpayer money at that, to fight a legal battle. Australia could soon be voting to legalize gay marriage. The government has announced a backup plan allowing citizens to vote on the matter after the country's ruling party refused to vote on the gay marriage bill. The move would allow Australians to decide if they want to legalize gay marriage. Under this plan, citizens would receive a ballot through the mail starting in September. These days, Mark Zuckerberg looks less like a Silicon Valley CEO and more like an Iowa caucus contender. He's eaten local fare with Hawkeye State residents, a ritual for presidential hopefuls, gotten his hands dirty on a factory floor in a fluorescent vest, something we've seen from politicians trying to build a following, and he's even let a few jump shots fly, a commonplace campaign trail photo op. On top of all that, Zuckerberg's foundation has former Obama campaign whiz David Pluff on the payroll, and they just hired former Clinton pollster Joel Benenson. You don't tend to hire pollsters unless you want to know what people are thinking. Uh, so my guess is the pollster is helping him understand the American people. If Zuckerberg gets political, there are hurdles ahead. To survive the Democratic primary, the first thing he's going to need to do is appeal to women more than he's been able to do as a corporate leader so far. One of the big criticisms of Facebook Inc. is that they don't hire women. Women aren't elevated and women's voices are suppressed internally. New company data shows Facebook's workforce is 35% female, an improvement over last year. And as the company changes, so does the CEO. Asked on Facebook if he's still an atheist, Zuckerberg wrote, quote, no. I was raised Jewish, and then I went through a period where I questioned things, but now I believe religion is very important. Then this spring came a commencement address that sounded like a campaign speech. How about stopping climate change before we destroy the planet and getting millions of people involved manufacturing and installing solar panels? How about curing all diseases and getting people involved by asking volunteers to share their health data, track their health data, and share their genomes? Forbes says the Facebook founder is worth more than $70 billion, and the Facebook friends who helped to make him that rich could help him finance a campaign, too. He has the infrastructure to reach pretty much everyone in America. Every voter in America pretty much is on Facebook. And Facebook has new functionalities that allow you to raise money through the platform that he could definitely leverage to his advantage. Like President Trump, Zuckerberg's yearly salary is $1. But unlike President Trump, Zuckerberg isn't old enough to be sworn in for another two years. A battle's being waged for the soul of the left. Far from Washington, away from all this drama in the White House, there's an actual debate going on in the Democratic Party about abortion and whether pro-life candidates ought to be allowed in the party. Well, a progressive group has released a statement of principles arguing that opposition to abortion is incompatible with being progressive. In part, the statement says this, quote, as progressives, we stand united in the belief that a woman's autonomy over her own body is not a secondary issue or a social issue, but rather a human right and a necessity in order to attain and preserve economic security in her life. Police have charged a 17-year-old teen with attempted murder after abandoning her baby outside in a plastic bag for three days. Miraculously, the baby survived. Officers say the mother left the eight-month-old in a bag under bushes in a Sayre, Pennsylvania neighborhood. Two sisters found the girl Tuesday afternoon after hearing odd noises. Police say the neighbors who found the child began to give her aid until emergency personnel arrived on scene. The baby was hospitalized and in stable condition Wednesday. Many of us know someone who inherited a gene that caused them to get a terrible disease, like Alzheimer's or cancer. Now, scientists say they've developed a technique to get rid of those problem genes and therefore the diseases they cause. 
It's called gene editing. As the name suggests, scientists remove the bad gene and replace it with a healthy one. They did this in an Oregon lab by replacing a gene in a human embryo that caused a potentially deadly heart condition. The embryo was later destroyed. Scientists say gene editing will allow them to prevent a whole host of other inherited diseases, but some don't like the way the process is being tested. The concern here is that uh, what they did is uh, effectively killed a number of embryos in order to get the genetic change that they want. And uh, we believe that that could have been done later in the process to actually treat um, even an unborn child or a child with that disease. Another worry is that this could lead to the creation of so-called designer babies, where scientists alter an embryo's genetics not to save a life or prevent a disease, but to make the person better looking, better in sports and school. With this technology, we're talking about altering life and altering the germline um, uh, heredity of, of people, and that creates a, a lot of concerns for, uh, for us and a lot of other people. Many in the scientific community share that concern. Scientists who gathered from around the world in Washington, D.C. last year said gene editing should only be used to save lives and alleviate suffering. People start talking about eye color, hair color. Sometimes people start talking about things like memory enhancement or muscle mass and things like that. And I think we really need to be careful about that because quite frankly, some of that involves very, very complicated science in terms of the numbers of genes that you'd have to manipulate, etc. And at least for now, that's not the game. It's difficult to prevent those experiments from happening, but what you can do as a community is set clear guidelines about what would be an acceptable experiment and what would be an unacceptable experiment, and to not let those people that perform unacceptable biological experiments get away without some form of regulation or punishment.